from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Oh, it is almost time. The annular eclipse is less than a day away from passing through the San Antonio and surrounding areas. It'll be the first time since 1940 that an annular eclipse was best seen in San Antonio. There are plenty of events going on here in the Alamo City and across our area. Yeah, no matter where you plan to check it out tomorrow, you'll want to know what the weather's going to be like. Let's get right over to meteorologist Adam Kasky for your eclipse authority forecast. Adam, timing and weather so key tomorrow. It is, and especially cloud cover. That's what counts. Temperatures, eh, it doesn't really matter. It's all about visibility, looking upward, being able to see the eclipse with the appropriate certified protective eyewear. We have a cold front moving in right now. You can see this jagged line of clouds, broken line of clouds. That's the front moving into northern Bear County, about to hit Highway 90 west of town as well. This is pushing through. I do think we will have some clouds even redeveloping overnight behind this front. Most of the clouds, especially west along the Rio Grande and south down I-35. This is tomorrow morning. I do anticipate our forecast hasn't changed. We anticipate most of the clouds in San Antonio to clear out by eclipse time and then become broken farther west of town, but definitely more clouds closer you are to the Rio Grande. Ideal locations I think would be around Bear County, immediate surrounding communities and up in the hill country off the I-10 corridor. Notice as the peak eclipse moves in, some passing clouds still likely farther to the west, especially between Hondo, Uvalde and particularly Del Rio to Eagle Pass. And then we clear out for the rest of the day. But it's all about viewing in terms of lack of cloud cover, partly cloudy early, clearing out here in San Antonio for eclipse time. And I do think the temperature is going to fall off a little bit as the eclipse happens late morning on into the midday. We're going to talk more about the cold front, what it means to your weekend weather, and even how quickly you're going to notice some changes tonight in just a bit. All right, thanks, Adam. In our latest case, that explains our team of meteorologists breaks down everything you need to know to understand what will be happening tomorrow during this eclipse, why this is so significant and why you might want to check out what's happening on the ground, too. You can check out this case that explains right now on ksat.com or on the KSAT YouTube channel. And you can find all of your eclipse, all of our eclipse coverage, your eclipse coverage to get you ready for tomorrow. Right now on KSAT.com, you can get there by scanning the QR code on your screen. We'll have full coverage of the event on GMSA tomorrow morning starting at 6. Keep it right here on air and online. Texas lawmakers are back in the state capitol debating the creation of a school voucher program. The idea is it would allow parents to choose where to send taxpayer dollars to private schools or to public schools. Cabello Juarez tells us how one city councilwoman believes the most impoverished districts in San Antonio would be hurt by the state bill. Every student is allotted money from the state and it all goes to public schools. The education savings account bill would allow parents to choose whether that money will go to public schools or a private school of their choice. I have a responsibility to my constituency. District 5 Councilwoman Terry Castillo spoke against the bill at the Capitol on Monday. Four of the five school districts within her district are having or discussing school closures. South San Antonio ISD, San Antonio ISD, Harlandale ISD are making plans for school closures, and Edgewood ISD is beginning the conversation. We're seeing these closures is because a low birth rate, the role of charter schools, and the lack of affordable housing. Castillo says the proposed bill could cause more public school closures, forcing parents to drive outside their neighborhood to take their child to school. They can't afford to commute to the nearest public school. Um, and with that, uh, with the decrease in enrollment, it will impact school funding. And then we'll continue to have these conversations about school closures. Every parent wants a great education for their kids. Inga Cotton with San Antonio Charter Moms is neutral about the proposed education savings account bill. She says her role is to help inform parents about what type of experience parents want for their child, public, private or charter, saying both public and charter schools have STEM based college readiness programs. We see our job as this information source and helping families understand the landscape, you know, more so than try to push one way or another, um, you know, whether there should or should not be ESAs in Texas. What I'm hearing from my community members is that continued struggle and fight to ensure that our children in our community continue to have access to quality schools. The bill is heading to the Texas House for further discussion. Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. 
A major fentanyl bust for the Bear County Sheriff's Office. A routine traffic stop turned out to be a potentially life saving seizure when deputies took pills containing the lethal narcotic off San Antonio streets. These are the two packages that contained about 40,000 pills that tested positive for fentanyl. BCSO made a find during a traffic stop in the 6800 block of San Pedro on October 6th, but just recently they confirmed those pills were made with the drug fentanyl. 19 year old Brian Betancourt facing a felony charge of possession and intent to deliver. Although this is a win for law enforcement, it's also a scary indication of the trend that law enforcement are seeing on our streets. The Bear County Sheriff's Office seized enough fentanyl uh, to kill half the residents of Bear County. That's over a million people that could have died based upon the fentanyl that we seized in 2021. Sheriff Javier Salazar says he doesn't have the exact stats for 2022 and 2023, but that the numbers are rising. And on top of that, the potency of the pills also seem to be growing. Tomorrow, angel moms who've lost a loved one to fentanyl holding a fentanyl awareness walk. It's from 4 to 8 p.m. at Brook City Base at the Green Line there. We also have a case that explains the dives into what fentanyl is, and you can check that out by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. People breathing a little bit easier now in a neighborhood that was targeted by an arsonist this summer. San Antonio police have arrested a suspect in connection with those fires. Five homes were damaged. Katrina Weber spoke with a neighbor who played a key role in that suspect's capture. The flames and smoke tearing through the 900 block of Southwest 36th Street that morning were unforgettable. Three different fires, which investigators believe were purposely set damaged or destroyed four homes and an apartment building August 6th. At least some of them were vacant. My house almost caught fire. There was a couple of spots where the guys started catching fire from the ashes that were flying. This man who wanted to hide his identity watched in horror, wondering for a while if his family might lose everything. What he says he didn't wonder about was who started the fires. He gave police information that led to the arrest of 35-year-old Roland Ramirez. Every time I saw him, I caught a cause, but he got away five times and we finally caught him. The man says he recognized Ramirez as someone who regularly hung out around the area. Thinking the suspect might come back, he had been watching out for him. Yes, that was my mission. Finally, yesterday evening, he says his work paid off. He says he saw Ramirez heading toward yet another vacant house nearby and followed him. Walking, but I was in my truck. But I was like three blocks away because I knew if he found out I was following him, he was on the run. Officers this time were able to arrest Ramirez on a charge of arson. One neighbor who I spoke to told me that he's glad the suspected arsonist has been caught, but he says that fire destroyed some of his property that he still hasn't been able to replace. While recovering from the damage here will take some time, neighbors say with Ramirez in jail, they're no longer worried about any new damage being done. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. We are working to learn the name of a woman who was hit and killed while crossing a northwest side street. This happened around 930 last night on Wood Lake Drive near Fredericksburg Road. Officers say that woman was crossing Fredericksburg when she was hit. SAPD says she was not using a crosswalk. We're told the driver who hit the woman did stop to help. And as of now, no one is facing any charges. Is San Antonio police investigating what officers are calling two separate shootings where both victims were shot in the legs with shotgun pellets. Both happened on the city's west side this morning. The first happened about 1 a.m. near Loop 410 in Marbach. Officers say the victim told them someone shot him through his front door. An hour later, police say someone else was shot in the leg at an apartment complex on Calabria. Both victims were taken to the hospital. They're expected to recover. The suspect hasn't been found. More than 1,500 new jobs are expected to come to San Antonio thanks to an agriculture equipment manufacturer. This morning, city and county leaders announced that JCB is expanding to the Alamo City. City leaders describe JCB as the world's largest privately owned equipment manufacturing company. Mayor Ron Nirenberg and Bear County Judge Peter Sakai say this is expected to have a $30 billion impact locally over 10 years. It will also bring in those more than 1,500 new jobs. Texas is in a great place. You know, it's central to the country, great port access, 
a great pro-business climate. I'd hope that other companies take notice of the incredible opportunities on the south side with the IH35 corridor, with obviously Union Pacific and the railroad. Um, we just have a lot of great assets and it's time to reinvest in the south side and this company is doing it. I'm excited about it. This will be the company's second North American location. The plant will be built on 400 acres of land on the south side. That's great news. All right, let's take traffic authority outside right now. I-35 at New Braunfels. This is kind of just a Friday thing. It's the southbound lanes of I-35 as you head towards downtown. Slow going as you hit, you know, 281 and 37 and all those fun things on a Friday afternoon. A <laughs> Friday thing and an I-35 thing. Yeah. <laughs> Well, guess what is coming up? The Dia de los Muertos Festival at Hemisphere Park. It is just a few weeks away. This happens October 28th and the 29th. Scan the QR code you see here on your screen to get tickets and learn more about all the events. Do you have some medical questions? Starting next week right here on the News at 6, we're going to take your health care questions to local doctors. Whether you're curious about the latest health care trends or you just maybe want some advice, maybe have a coded question. We got you covered. If you want to submit a question, all you need to do, scan this QR code, then we will take your questions to the doctors. KSAT 12's Doc Talk starts next Thursday at 630. Still ahead here on the news at six, the Battle of Medina has a place in history books, but not a place on the map, perhaps until now. A look at a local historian's years long journey to find out where that battle happened on Texas soil coming up. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on The Night Beat. Opioid and other substance addictions have torn families apart across the country, even locally. And now, a local nonprofit that served San Antonio for decades is spreading a message for change this weekend, and we have a preview. Also, excitement is growing for tomorrow's annular eclipse, but not everybody is looking forward to the event. Why some in the town of Bandera have concerns about all the crowds. We'll see you for those stories and so much more tonight on the Night Beat. Thank you, Stephanie. And now to a historic discovery. But first, some recent history. In 2022, Justin Horn accompanied Brandon Seal, a local historian and podcaster, on his quest to find where the Battle of Medina was fought. It remains one of the bloodiest battles ever fought on Texas soil, the bloodiest, long overshadowed, though, by more notorious fights. It happened in 1813, but the location was somehow lost to history. As Justin Hornet reports, the end of that search, though, may be near. Five years ago, Brandon Seal started a podcast about San Antonio history. I guess with like most history, the deeper you go in, the more mysteries you find. There was one glaring mystery that stood out. It was a battle fought near San Antonio in 1813, the bloodiest battle in Texas history, and a pivotal one pitting a group of Tejano, Native American, and Anglo-Texas independence fighters against the Spanish Royal Army. Yet somehow the Battle of Medina gets lost in history. Something like a third of the non-Indian population of Texas was probably killed at or in the immediate aftermath of the battle. 500 San Antonio women were imprisoned and insulted, assaulted, and worse, their children ripped away from them. More than a thousand men died. It was traumatic to say the least. So then why was it forgotten? Because for one, it gets overshadowed by the Alamo, by the Battle of San Jacinto, by the events of 1835-36, which do successfully achieve Texas's independence. Which brings us to today. Seal, along with his partners, have continued a years-long mission to find where the battle was fought. And all of this painstaking work may have paid off. Those digging today feel like they're in the general vicinity of where this battle was fought, and that's what they're trying to do, is find evidence to prove that. Previously, they found quite a few artifacts nearby, which give them confidence that they're in the right spot. We, we believe that so far we have found a conflict site consistent with the archival records of the battle. 26 munitions that date back to the time of the battle have been found near the Medina River in Southern Bear County. Half of them, compellingly, we have tied to a cannonball, a very small cannonball found in the neck of a body that was found in, in 1968. If anyone finds anything behind me, you're gonna hear a scream of musket ball from, from back there someplace. Helping in this dig are true experts on munitions military veterans. They're part of a group called AVAR, American Veterans Archaeological Recovery. 
They've partnered with Seal to solve this mystery. But what we really bring to the field is this knowledge of doing systematic metal detector surveys and the equipment to do so. And over the last couple of years, they found quite a bit. It's now on display at the Whitney Museum. But this isn't the end. There's more work to be done. Conflict sites have been found. However, they don't believe they've located the main battlefield yet. There's just this, this gnawing need in your mind to try and really know where and to put, put a, up a spot on a map. Justin Horn, KSAT 12 News. Okay, that is a really cool story. It is. Yeah. Yeah, Battle of Medina mm -hmm. covered. Fascinating. Yeah. All right, live look outside right now, 89 degrees. Adam says the cold front's moving through as we speak. Oh, it is as we speak. Now, it's not the kind of front where it hits and ooh, it's going to get cold outside. Ah, if you're headed to football games, you're going to be OK. It's just going to be a little windy and the humidity is going to drop. You notice on our live cam some of the clouds out there and we talked earlier about the cloud cover forecast. We have more on that on our website pertaining to the eclipse tomorrow and much more information as well. Let's this is what I think it's going to look like. I added some clouds on this to give you an idea of what I think it's going to look like at the beginning of the eclipse here in San Antonio, starting at 1023 AM when it's partial, then the max eclipse when we're in the annular phase with the ring of fire. Still some passing clouds, but generally pretty good viewing. And by the time it comes to an end, the clouds are completely gone and we clear on out. Let's talk about the winds starting to pick up to our north, but after sunset, we'll see those winds really pick up by 9 p.m. It's going to make a difference in some of those football games that are still going on because it's going to be a north wind steady at probably 10 to 20 gusting even higher than that at times. This is our feature cast for wind gusts up to 30 miles per hour through the night. So if you hear the uh, north facing window rattle a little bit or your you know trees shaking outside, we haven't heard it in quite some time from a cold front. That's what it is tonight because it's going to be gusty through the morning tomorrow as well. Most of the day you're going to notice that wind. 89 degrees right now with some of those clouds. Dew point of 66, still humid. The cold front is going to change that. We have the mugginess in the air already changing it in the hill country. Rock Springs, dew point of 46. Kerrville down to 52. But you get along Highway 90, still very muggy. Dew points upper 60s. 70 for the dew point in Bulverde. Within a few hours, that all changes. As the cold front moves in, the wind picks up, and by 10 o'clock, I think from Highway 90 northward, we're going to notice that plunge in the dew points and the lack of mugginess in the air. And then that, of course, is going to spread southward thereafter. And by tomorrow morning, all the humidity is completely swept away. Let's talk temperatures with this front. 93 are high today. That's 10 degrees above average, still four degrees shy of the record. We actually had a one one hundredth of an inch of rain, the low clouds, fog and mist added up to a hundredth of an inch at the airport. We had a few sprinkles. The temperatures do not drop off significantly right as this front hits. It's actually a gradual process. You go up to Midland behind the front and Abilene 74 Amarillo at 64. You had to get up into the plains. North Platte, Nebraska 48 Pierce, South Dakota 45 Casper, Wyoming 42. You have to get farther north for that really noticeably cooler air, which is going to hit over the weekend, very fall like conditions, but for now still warm temperatures around town, upper 80s as we go through the evening, 8 o'clock, 81, 10 p.m. 76 and windy, but with low humidity and by midnight still at 74. So see, not really all that cool out there tonight because of that cold front changes tomorrow, though, and especially uh, by Sunday morning and thereafter 62 at 7 a.m. tomorrow by 10 a.m. As we get ready for the eclipse, we're at 65. We'll go up to 67 at 11 and then because of the eclipse drop down to 62 by noon, only to slowly climb back up to 79 for the high temperature with that afternoon sun. For the most part, upper 70s all across our area. 78 Lake Hills, La Soya 79, Stone Oak 78. I want to talk morning temperatures quickly because we're going to be below average in sweatshirt weather. <laughs> Break out the hoodies. 55 Sunday morning, but especially Monday at 51. Check out Tuesday, 49. A nice extended stretch a fall like weather with a slight chance of rain by next Thursday. Stretch and a kick. Yeah, yes. I did that little sweatshirt shimmy with you there. Yeah, you, you know, did. Wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I felt <laughs> it. Nice. I think Thanks, we got a new dance. <laughs> by the way, I'm glad I don't have all the pressure that kids have now. You got to make a public homecoming. Oh, ask somebody. Yeah. You got to yeah. get moms. All this stuff. I mean, it's homecoming time. 
Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the whole mum thing? No, I'm Mary? not. Oh, it's, mums never are a heard thing. Of it. You gotta, a it's a flower deal. you have to buy for your date, and sometimes you buy big and like lots of them. Sometimes and, they're larger than the kids yes, wearing them. Yes, when it comes to homecoming, mum's the word. <laughs> wow, that's, that <laughs> sounds amazing. <laughs> but yes, homecoming season is in the air. And tonight, one of our big in coverage road trip stops brings us to Hondo for Hondo's homecoming game versus Lytle. And tonight, the Spurs are back in action. Game two of the preseason against Miami is underway. We'll talk about that matchup after the break. It's everything. When you have the stands packed, it's everything you want. And the band too, it's crazy. You can feel the atmosphere. Good. Right, let's go compete today. Bring it up right here. We will. feel everybody so it's just awesome homecoming games are where memories are made and as hondo's dominic corona just said playing in front of a spirited homecoming crowd is everything tonight the owls host lytle which will be featured in our big game coverage road trip and both district rivals enter the matchup sporting identical five in one records let's take a trip to barry field in hondo to preview the big game Hondo's district opener ended in disappointment last week when Jordanton handed the Owls their first loss of the season, 56 to 25. They're a playoff team, right? So they show you what playoff teams are going to look like um, and, and the kind of caliber and level that you've got to play at. Uh, so we know we've got to up our game a little bit as well. Uh, and we definitely had some guys step up, uh, and we had a few that, that have got to play better when we go into those big games. The early loss to one of District 14 3A D1's best won't phase Hondo's goal to make a deep run in the postseason. Last year, the Owls also fell to Jordanton. But instead of getting down, Hondo finished the rest of its district schedule 4 and 0. One Hondo star who will be key in a potential bounce back game is wide receiver Ryan Gillum. The senior is on the brink of setting the school's receiving touchdowns record. Right now, he's tied with 11. I'm just super excited to this goal's been in my sights since the beginning of the season. I'm just ready to go out there and break it. It's been a Pretty much a team goal for us because we've been wanting to throw the ball a little bit more and kind of incorporate a lot of other areas into our game. On the other side, Lytle comes into the matchup fresh off of a district win over Poteet. The Pirates' goal this year was to turn its culture around following their one-win season last year. And so far, they're on the right track. All right, here's the road trip route. Hondo for that game then will be in Medina Valley for their kickoff with Southwest. It's crazy, you know, just to see the, the city, um, the city like really, really lock in um, this year. Um, you know, compared from last year, you know, I can see a, a bigger, a bigger change. Um, and I'm excited for it. We are all excited for it. This evening, the Spurs are back on the court for their second preseason game against Miami. The Heat's top players will be sitting this one out like Jimmy Butler, Tyler Hero and Bam Adebayo. On the flip side, San Antonio will have Jeremy Sohan back in the lineup, but Keldon Johnson, Doug McDermott and Zach Collins will not play. Here it is. The Heat and Spurs tip off inside Frostbank Center at 630. We'll talk about that game tonight on the Night Beat. This Sunday, the Lone Star State Showdown begins for a spot in the World Series. The defending champion Houston Astros are in their seventh consecutive ALCS, and this time they play the Texas Rangers. It will be the first meeting between the two in the playoffs. The AL West rivals both won 90 games during the regular season, but Houston was 9-4 against the Rangers. First pitch is on Sunday at 7:15 in Houston. I hear the television stations in Houston and Dallas are already talking smack back and forth. Oh, I'm sure they are. Yeah. As they should be. Yeah. I think maybe San Antonio should be the arbiter. Yeah. Just like, you know, let's make sure things don't get out <laughs> of hand. You want to keep the peace? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Arm's length. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mary. All right. Puro picks for the weekend coming up next.